I'm Marco Hansen. I'm Margaret Hansen. And we are uh, two of the owners of Texan Translation, and we do a lot of uh, certified translations that need notarizations and apostilles. Um, so we thought it would be good to share some of the uh, tips and tricks for um, things that we've learned over the years to make sure that the translation you prepare can get notarized and apostilled when it needs to be. Um, so I guess, uh, are there any more introductory things you're supposed to mention? Keep yourself on mute. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll get back to those when we can. Uh, yeah, I think okay. that's it. Um, can you all see the, the link, the notepad thing over there? You yeah, got it. I okay. Yeah. <laughs> that may be in the way. Okay. So Margaret, you want to, um, Oh, by the way, this is just the uh, charitable organization, uh, Raices, the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services, that a portion of your ticket today is going to support. So thank you for making that donation. This is a, a good group. If you're looking for an organization to volunteer with, um, they do have some need for volunteer interpretation, like lots of other organizations around the country. I know we have people here from every time zone. So... Margaret, why don't you take it away? Okay, so here are some things we're, we're going to cover today. Um, a little bit about the difference between what it means to be a notary in the U.S. versus in other countries. There are um, several differences and they are significant. Um, what notaries do here in the U.S., uh, what an apostille is, what an authentication is, how they're the same, how they're different, um, and what they're used for. Uh, certifications versus notarizations versus apostilles for translators, um, how to become a notary public, and errors that may keep your translation from being notarized or apostilled. So first off, uh, we've got different ways of saying notary in different countries. A notary um, in the US is a public official who witnesses the making of a document and signs it to show that it is authentic. Now, in some places, the public official doesn't witness the making of the document at all. Um, that's the official definition of what a notary does, but in practice, uh, notaries rarely actually see the document made. It's brought to them already done, and it's simply signed in front of them. Where in other countries, notaries may be involved in the process of creating the document before it's signed. So, all right, so a common law notary um, you know, why don't you take this one? Okay. Um, I'm going to put the links in the chat one more time for the people who are just joining us. Uh, the two major legal systems around the world are common law and civil law, and, and there are other legal systems like Sharia law in certain countries. Um, but every country that used to be part of the British Empire, um, the UK and Australia and New Zealand and the US, as far as I know, um, are under the common law system, except for certain exceptions like Quebec and Louisiana that um, have a that inherited the French legal system for civil law, and so common law means that um, I won't get into the definitions. Um, a common law notary. It's easy to become a common law notary, and just about anybody can do it. In our state, for example, you just have to be 18 and not have committed certain types of serious crimes. It costs under $100 to. Uh, become a notary, and that includes um, taking out an insurance policy, a bond uh, for your services. Uh, you don't have to renew for four years. There is no training or education or testing to speak of. Uh, you don't even have to be a U.S. citizen or speak the English language to become a notary. And so it's a pretty low bar. While in other countries, like Mexico in this example, and other countries that inherited the civil law system from the Roman Empire, um, a notary is an attorney, an experienced attorney, and holds a government uh, credential that is difficult to obtain and has much greater authority and much greater responsibility in transactions like uh, purchasing real estate. And so um, takeaway here is it's easy to become a notary in the US. And it does vary, you see the little asterisk there, it does vary by state. And so we, of course, you see our Texas flag, we are experts in, <laughs> is, in is Texas that, stuff. Is that too obnoxious? Go ahead and tell me if it's too obnoxious. Put it I just in the chat. put it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be gentle. <laughs> um, we um, so in in Texas, it the, the really is a very low bar. Like you have to be breathing, and have a pulse, and be over the age of eighteen, and not have committed a serious crime, and that's it. 
other states have more training, more um, information that they provide, and a test that you have to take, but it, that does vary by state. So you want to, um, like I said, we'll have, here we have, um, notary FAQs by state, and when we send this out to you, you we've already sent it Everybody out should have gotten it about half an hour ago in your email. So check your email and um, make sure you've got this, and then you can click on your state and see information about being a notary in your state. All the details are a little bit different in terms of how much the application costs, how many years it lasts, and then um, who can do what as a notary, but uh, they all have a similar function in the U.S., which is uh, basically verifying the identity of somebody who's signing an official document. And uh, one, one other point about notaries, because as Marco mentioned, the, the training required in, for example, a civil law country like Mexico is so much more in, involved um, and so much uh, deeper. You have to have, you just have a lot, have, to have a lot more credentials and experience and things like that compared to the U.S. It is important that when you are going into a different language besides English, in English you can say, "I am a notary. I am a notary public." But in other languages, you cannot say, "I am a notary." There's another term that's used, um, and I, I, I can tell you in Spanish, "notario." means a notary that can do all the things and has all the legal training. I don't have that, so I cannot call myself a notaria in Spanish. I can only call myself basically a, a civil servant or, or um, there's just a different term. And I, because this isn't language specific to Spanish, it doesn't matter. Um, but do know what the terms are in your language that you translate into from English so that you're not accidentally giving somebody more credentials than they actually have. Sure, so uh, what do notaries do? There are a variety of kinds of things that a notary can sign, and not all states do all of these things. Um, an acknowledgement is the most common, that's what we do the most of. Um, basically, you're saying, I watched this person sign this thing, and they showed me an ID so I could prove that it was the same person. I saw the signature on the ID, I watched them sign, it's the same, this is the same person. And, and that's what you're doing. You're just authenticating the signature of the person signing the document. You're not necessarily having anything to do with the document itself. You should kind of flip through, make sure it looks like it's a legit document of some kind. And you have the right to say, I don't feel comfortable notarizing this for whatever reason. Um, and you would want to mark that in your logbook, refuse to notarize this document because, you know, whatever. And they don't have to see you do that, but you'll have a logbook. Um, where is your logbook? Do you have your hand? Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll keep a record of all of your notarizations, and they look different. Mine looks different than this. Um, but you keep track of, of different pieces of information, and that varies by state also. And so when you order your book, there'll be some pieces of information that you don't need. Some states require a fingerprint. Texas, you cannot take the fingerprint, so you need to know things like that. Anyway. Um, just you're acknowledging that the, that the person who's, appear before, who's appearing before you is who they say they are, and you watched them sign it, and so then you can sign and stamp. Jurats um, and verifications on oath, sometimes they need to swear. When you see sworn and subscribed to me this day, blah, 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 if it says sworn and subscribed, it means they swore everything here is true, and then they signed, they subscribed the document, okay? Um, Oaths and affirmations. Sometimes, um, talk talk to us a little bit about that because that's something you've seen done, I think, in court. I'm sure the oath and, or the affirmation and oath is when you uh, use the word swear. In some places, you swear on based on your belief on the higher power. Some people, for religious reasons or ethical reasons, would rather affirm, but it has the same legal weight, and that is. Um, a, uh, like if somebody's taking an oath of office, um, the notary in some states will act as an official to verify that person has um, sworn in, has accepted the oath of office. And so in that case, there may not be a written document per se involved. It's them swearing something and you watched it happen. And so that gets recorded in your book. And in some states, uh, the last one is a copy certification. In some states, you can also verify a reproduction of an original document, like a photocopy. If you take a photocopy of somebody's birth certificate, then you can sign that and say, this is a, a, a real copy. I, I watched it being copied and it's legit. And, and I mean, depending on what it's being used for, who knows if that's, <laughs> if that's 
you if you're allowed to do that or not. But okay, apostilles and authentications. Me toca a mí. Sí. Um, I see some people in the chat saying they didn't get my email a uh, half an hour before this started, 40 minutes ago now. Um, I'm sorry, I sent it out to everybody who had registered at that point uh, to the email that you used to register it. I can send it out again on Monday, but if you didn't get it before, you probably won't get it next time either. So I'm not sure how to help. Um, maybe they can put their email right now into the chat or provide, a separate, it. Uh, provide a separate email or you know, yeah. give us one or two, and then we will keep a record of the chat. And then we can just try to make sure everybody okay. got that. Yeah, if you put your email in the chat, then you can. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you, Teresa. So there's something called an apostille, also pronounced an apostle. It's a French word, so there's no official universal way to say it in English. Um, the authentication letter is a similar document. And apostilles, I'm going to say apostille. Uh, it, the, it, it's from a Latin term that means uh, marginal annotation, I think, or an, an endnote. And it goes back to 1961 when a bunch of countries got together and said, it we're wasting too much time on sending paperwork back and forth. We need to come up with a simple way to make sure that paperwork coming from another country is legit. And so they made up this little form that has 10 points on it. And um, they said, no matter what we send to another country, we're going to put these 10 pieces of information in the same order, and we're going to let the certain official in each country verify the identity of the people who signed the document so that when it gets to the new country, they can trust that it's uh, an actual authentic document. And so it's intended to simplify um, international relations. And uh, over the years, more and more countries have signed the Apostille Convention. We're up to 124 now. It's the blue and red ones on that map in the top right-hand corner. And um, if you're in one of the gray countries, that means you don't belong to the Apostille Convention. And instead of an Apostille, you get an authentication letter, which is very similar for all practical purposes. It's the same document, just in a different format. Here are a couple of examples of Apostilles coming from states in the US. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that they have the same 10 points on them. The format is different. Uh, each state is allowed to arrange it how they want as long as those 10 points are in order. And um, everything is in English on this, uh, except for one sentence underneath the word apostilles in French that's required to be in French on every, every version of the apostille used around the world. And you know, uh, we do have a little note at the top there. So we got all these off of the internet and they are public domain. And so some of them still have uh, people's names or things on them, but that's how we got them off the internet. And so these aren't clients of ours that we're sharing private information <laughs> for. This is on the internet, the World Wide Web for all to see. Wikipedia. So, yeah, so we didn't yeah. bother. We figured if it's already out there, then there's no reason for us to block, block it out. But some were blocked out to a degree. And so here we have three other countries, um, China, Armenia, and Brazil. And you'll see a lot of writing, the size and the amount of detail and the, and the languages that are on there. They all include English. Um, the Armenian one doesn't include any Armenian language except on the rubber stamp. The Brazilian one has English, French, and Portuguese. And so if you... Um, translate regularly the apostilles from a given country, you'll no doubt come up with your um, version of it that you always use. You can just cut and paste from old jobs and then you won't have to translate that afresh each time. And you'll note on these that um, that little part in, in French right underneath the word apostille remains in French on all of them, regardless of the country. Yeah. So the process that we're talking about here is how to take your translation and make it more official so that it will be acceptable to different kinds of end users in different places. And this is kind of a messy diagram. You haven't seen this slide yet, had yeah, you? Yeah, no, this is new. Let me, let me try to explain what I'm, what I'm getting at here. Um, there, are, there are three levels of, I'll say fanciness, three levels of officialness um, that you can give to a translation that you've prepared. And in the inner circle, we have um, some bureaucrat creates a document and issues it to a private party. Um, that's number one. And number two, that private party finds a translator who can prepare a translation of it. And you, number three, translate that document, and it gets sent across to number six, the end user. Um, a lot of the translations we do um, just need those three steps, and those are the four people involved. Um, some end users say, no, we also need it to be notarized. 
And so then you add step number four, you, the translator, sign before a notary public, and then it gets sent to the end user as a notarized and certified translation. They can't notarize it. They can't notarize a translation that isn't certified. So you have to go in these in this order, these steps. And then occasionally, if it's being sent outside of the United States to another country or coming in from another country, you have to add the the last step, which is uh, Secretary of State or Department of State for your state or for the federal government will put an apostille statement on top of everything. And they can't apostille a translation that isn't already certified and notarized. So again, it has to go in this progression of steps. And you could think of this as tiers of service. If you're charging your clients for them, you could say this price for a translation, this price for a certified translation, this price for a certified and notarized translation, this price for a certified, notarized, and apostille translation. Because each step along the way adds to your time and effort to prepare it. And you don't have to do it all. Some people think they need it to be notarized and they don't really well if they want to pay you to get it notarized and then they can do that but um, we always try to um, recommend the, the least levels of fanciness possible because then they're not wasting their money is fanciness a word it is today okay your turn okay all right so uh as marco said there are different levels of um of requirements for what a translation needs to be considered complete by an end user. Um, a lot of, if you're just doing marketing materials or something that's going on to a website, they don't need a certification, right? They just want it to look the same way as their their other, their other their source language. They want the target language to look the same. They don't care if it's certified. They just want it to match, right? So, so that's the lower level. Then there's people who want something certified. Um, immigration, USCIS, which is the United States Customs Immigration, Immigration Service, they want a certification on there. College admissions are going to want certification. Court paperwork, vehicle titles, lots of lots of things need a certification on them. And that's and we're going to go over this a little bit. It's just a statement saying basically, I can do this. I'm qualified to do this translation. Um, it doesn't mean that you're a certified translator. You might be, but not necessarily. Right. Um, because the U.S. doesn't have a government body that certifies people to do translations like they do for interpreting translation we've talked about this in other webinars is a little bit like the wild west in terms of of not requiring uh, certain credentials to be to certify you as a translator you just have to be able to say in good faith i am qualified i speak these two languages well enough that i can do this translation make a statement i, I believe in myself <laughs> right i am good enough i am smart enough and write it down, sign it, and that's that's your bond. Um, some some people ask for official translations or sworn translations. That means a certification usually. Now this is where it depends on where something's coming from. Some countries, like Spain, for example, have what they call sworn translators. That is a a credential issued by the Spanish government, and sometimes. Entities in Spain require documents to be translated for their use by only a sworn translator. I am not a sworn translator by the Spanish government. And so if somebody brought me a document said I need this to go into Spanish and it needs to be done by a sworn translator, I would either need to find a sworn translator and subcontract out to them or say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So do know, be familiar with terms that, that might indicate your ability to do something or not. And always ask where the translation is going. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's point three. You don't need a credential or a license um, or anything special to, to be considered a sort of, to be able to certify your translation. That said, most end users really like to see lots of stamps and seals on things. And so if you can put a seal of some kind saying that, this is legit it helps so marco for example is um certified by the american translators association to translate from spanish to english so if he does a translation spanish to english he can put his seal from the ata on there and it looks fancy and cool i don't have that certification <laughs> and so there are some translations that i don't do that he does instead and I have a red rubber stamp that says accuracy guaranteed text and translation. And I stick that on there because people like rubber stamps. And if you want to get lots of rubber stamps that say all kinds of things, 
feel free to do that. It's like, not like a square no. one, a rectangular one, and a circle one in three different colors. Right. Maybe, maybe <laughs> the red wax that you drip on, and then you like push that brass seal into there. Go for it. Some tell tell about um, the country that makes you sew your translations together. The craft project. Oh, oh our <laughs> beloved. We we have a, a wonderful client who's been coming back for about six months. We think he's done, <laughs> but every month or so he comes back and says, "Well, now my country says they need they also need me to do this. So here's what we've already done." Can we change this thing around and move this to the top and this goes to the back? And then they also want this part translated. Okay, so we fix that. And then he has to sew it with red thread and he has to put a little like sticker over it. And then that has to be stamped and signed it. And he has to do all these crafty things. And I told him, <laughs> I will translate things for you, but I am not going to do craft projects. That's not my area of expertise. But, and so now he brings us cookies every time he comes because he feels bad about how complicated the bureaucrats in his country are. <laughs> but that's just a point to, to say, know what you need to do and know what you can, when you can say, that's not really my job. Yeah. Anyway, um, when it's being sent to a, a different country, you may need to ask a few more questions to find out what what credentials are required to be able to prepare that translation and whether or not you can actually do it. So an, a, an important point to keep in mind is if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm bilingual and I translated this document for myself, but I'm not a certified translator. Can you certify it for me? Well, two things. First of all, don't ever certify someone else's translation, like sight unseen. Maybe if if you proofread it yourself and correct it and you're willing to stand behind it as an accurate translation, then you could um, sign it as a certifier. Um, but two, um, what was my other point going to be? I don't know, but you're responsible. If there are mistakes on there, you're responsible. If you're the one that signs your name to it. And so if, if, if uh, so oh, I wouldn't oh, do it. My other point was you don't have to be a certified translator to certify a translation. Um, so uh, there are times, rare occasions, when translators are called into court as witnesses because of a legal translation they prepared. And so whenever I'm working on a translation, I keep that at the back of my mind. Can I objectively testify under oath that I believe this is the accurate meaning of the original document? Or am I biased by the wishes of the person who hired me to translate it? You have to make sure that you can, you can be objective and that you don't um, just uh, tweak it to be more favorable to whichever side is hiring you in a case. If the document is about yourself, you can't prepare a certified translation of it. That's not a law, but that's a, a general practice. A lot of bureaucrats won't accept, say you're immigrating to the US and you translate your own birth certificate and send it into immigration and you sign the certification yourself. Generally, no bureaucrat will accept that. They'll send it back. Or if it's somebody else from your family that has the same last name. You should always double check your translation yourself. And I recommend putting one finger on the original and one finger on the translation and going through word for word and looking for any word you might have skipped, any rubber stamp, any fine print, any sticker, any barcode, any signature, any little detail. It all has to be represented in the translation. I mean, sometimes it's not a one for one equivalent, like maybe three words in the original are one word in your language or vice versa, but you can't just leave anything out because you feel that it's not important. And then give it to somebody else. Give it to a colleague to proofread before you send it out because we all make mistakes and we all would rather have the mistakes caught by our friends in-house before it's caught by our client or worse yet, the end user that the client gives your translation to and then rejects it. And your certification statement um, is, a, is a signed statement of accuracy and it also has to have the date and your contact information. And this is what ours look like. I was just going to comment on, on Mirna's comment in the chat. It is possible to do your own or to do something. I have a friend who was coming back from Brazil with her husband who was Brazilian and she did his, but it's just more likely to get rejected. It's not that it's impossible to do it, but it's just more likely that you're going to hit a stumbling block. So yeah, I, I'm glad it worked for you though. <laughs> so this is a kind of a sample of what our translations look like. We, we put a letterhead on there. So we've got who, who, what the company is that translated with our contact information at the bottom. We base our, our, our certification statements off of information that USCIS requires, and you can go to their website. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but they have certain pieces of information that they require 
to be in the certification statement, which probably include things like the, the two languages involved and that you have some degree of competency to translate and then contact information, a, a full name, an address, a phone number, or email or something like that. And so we start with a certification statement followed by an image of the document and then the translation. The image is not required. We like it, but a lot of people don't do that. So that's just your call. And we make it a little smaller so it's not meant to be a certified copy of it or anything like that. We just put it there so people can say, yeah, that looks like the same thing. Um, and Okay. So it's time to do our exercise oh. now. Um, there is a file that those of you who got the email from me got an email, and those of you who didn't, um, I think uh, Teresa, Teresa Estudio put it up here. Um, I will send it again. Um, certified and notarized translation template. Um, uh, let's just take a few minutes, and if you need to uh, run and get something to drink, you can do that now. But I'm going to put us on mute, and I'd like you to open this file which I just put in the chat for those of you who didn't get the email. And um, if, you, if you don't already have your own certification statement, here's a chance to take our generic one and modify it, plug in your own name, your own credentials, your own state, and set it up so that next time somebody asks you to do a certified translation, you'll be ready to go. Alexa, set a timer for five minutes. Five minutes, starting now. I received the document.
So a couple people are still having trouble finding the file. If it's not in your spam, um, I don't know what else to say. We put it in the chat here three times too. Uh, so if you're on a device that has uh, attachments in chat, you'll find it there. But if you're on like a Chromebook or an iPad, you probably are on a version of Zoom that doesn't allow you to get attachments by chat. So I'm sorry if you're having trouble getting that. Um, somebody. You know, we are going to cover that question. That oh, is a yeah. great question. And we are going to cover that in just a little yeah. bit. Alexa, stop. I have a Russian tutor named Alexa, and sometimes when I'm a call with I'm on a call with her, my my Amazon device will will interrupt the conversation and start talking to us. I always have to mute her. Um, okay, so let me move this out of the way so we can see our slides again. Uh, so this uh, format is the one that we typically use. Uh, we customize it. Sometimes we put it in two languages so that everybody involved can understand what it says. Um, your state will probably have a little bit different preferred wording, but the links in the PowerPoint to your state can answer that question for you. What is, what is a good uh, phrasing to use in your notary statement? Um, and somebody asked in the chat if, if, um, if the translator, because we are an agency, if the translator is not physically here in our office, what do we do about that? And we have a, a different statement that we use for a translation manager who will review the translation provided to us. And just even if it's a language that the, the translation manager doesn't know well, um, can just look and make sure that all the content is there and can you know check numbers and, and the formatting. And, and um, they've given us their word that it's a true and accurate translation. And so then the translated, translation manager will sign in front of the notary. But the translation manager has to do her due diligence because she could theoretically be called into court to testify about the qualifications of the contract she hired as translator and proofreader of this document. So it's, it's better if the translator is physically there to sign the certification statement so that the chain of custody is shorter and clearer. All right. So... Um, we've uh, finished uh, talking about certifications. Now we're going to talk about the next step of um, legalization. Yeah. So a lot of uh, end users don't require a notarization. USCIS does not. A lot of financial institutions, well, I would say kind of 50-50 on the financial. Um, but academic, like if you're um, trying to apply to a university and you went to college or high school in another country and you're trying to apply here or, or vice versa, um, you may not need a notarization, but um, but other people do. Um, for sure, the passport office here in the U.S. is going to require a uh, notarization on a document. Vehicle titles, if you're importing a car, um, it, something that's being apostilled for use abroad is going to need, the translation is going to need to be apostilled, I mean notarized, because an apostille can only be put onto something that has a Texas or a state seal on it. The Secretary of State of your state will only put an epistille onto a document that also has a seal of that state on it. And so your translation doesn't. And so a notary has to put their notarization on there because that notary stamp has the seal on it. Um, but notaries public only notarize the signature. They are a third party verifier of the identity of the signer. So Marco is gonna sign a document I am not Marco, so I can say, yep, that is Marco. I can check his ID, I can see it matches his face, I can watch him sign and see that his signature matches what's on the card, and so I, as a third party, can verify that he is who he says he is and watch him sign that thing. I can't do that for myself because I'm not an objective third party. You can't notarize your own signature, so you cannot sign as the translator and also sign as the notary. You have to pick one. You're either the translator or you're the notary. This varies state to state and probably country to country, but um, the degree of separation between the translator and the notary may have to be great and maybe not. In the state of Texas, I can notarize my husband's signature. It's not considered best practice, but as long as I don't have a vested financial interest in the document being signed, Meaning, if he's taking out a loan, I'm not going to notarize his signature. But if he's doing a translation, I don't have a vested financial interest in the translation itself, in whatever that document is. And so I can notarize his signature. 
We try to avoid that, but we've done it. But if you can find someone else who, to whom you're not related, that's even better. In our office, we, we usually have three notary publics available so that even if somebody's out running an errand or at lunch or is off that day, there will be uh, somebody there who can notarize somebody else's signature. So if you have a translation that you've certified and now you need to get it notarized, um, you can just search in Google Maps to find the nearest notary public. Um, your bank will probably do it for free. A lot of banks will do it for free, even if you don't have a bank account there, because they're just trying to make a good impression and be helpful. Make sure you take a photo ID, like a driver's license or passport. If you are doing this for a paying client, make sure that you charge for your time and mileage and effort on top of any fee that you have to pay to the notary itself. And ideally, if you do a lot of this, it would be good to find a buddy who lives like in your building or on your street who is, I don't know, retired or works from home who'd like to become a notary public. And you can say, I will pay $100 for you to be a notary public for the next four years. If anytime I bring something over with, a, you know, a plate of cookies or a beer or whatever your friend likes, um, you'll also notarize this for me and just find somebody in your area who um, who will be your notary uh, partner. If there's another translator, maybe you could both become uh, notaries and you could notarize each other's documents. Um, but it's so much easier. We For years, we drove to the notary and stood in line and then waited um, to get our stuff notarized and drove back. And it ended up being over an hour every time we needed something notarized. And nobody wants to pay for over an hour of a translator's time on top of the cost of the notary to get something notarized because they're like, Notaries only cost fifteen dollars. How come you're charging no, me? Even that much more, six or something yeah, like how that. come you're charging me so much? And it's because of the labor, not because of the parts. You know, like fixing your car, the labor is more expensive than the parts. Same applies to notarization. And depending on where you work, or if you're doing this full time, or, or just on the side, there may be somebody in the building that you work in who's already a notary, and you may be able to work out an agreement with them. Or like Marco said, find someone else who also needs notarization done, and just Trade trade services. Hmm, it's free in Ohio. Cool. Oh, that's interesting. How do those notaries make a living? I don't think notaries make a living as notaries. I okay. think it's a full-time job. Um, so next we have uh, apostilles. Let's say um, you're sending some translation to another country that's part of the apostille convention, or if not, a part of the authentication system. Um, in either case, uh, there are different times that the interpreter is involved with the apostille in different ways. And I put the picture down here from the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, um, Inception, where all of, like the cities get folded around and there's a dream within a dream and it's all confusing. And that's because sometimes we get asked to like translate an apostille and then the translation has to be the translation has to be apostille then you're getting like an apostille on a translation of an apostille and i'm just wondering how how long is this madness going to go on how many layers of apostilling and translation and legalization do we need before the bureaucrat will finally be happy with this the validity of this document but these are the these are three typical scenarios a document coming from the u.s let's say a birth certificate from into. from texas oh coming into the u.s a birth certificate from germany um, it has a German apostille on it, and when it gets to the vital statistics office in your city, they say, oh, there's German on here, um, you need to get a certified translation of this. And then you as a German translator will get these two pages, and you'll translate the German apostille, even though it's probably in German and English and French already. You know, bureaucrats who only speak English, they get scared when they see other languages and they want the whole thing translated over. And then you'll translate the second page, which is a German birth certificate into English, and then you'll give that certified translation to your client. And depending on who they're turning it into, they might also want your certified translation to be notarized, but probably not in that scenario. Uh, scenario number two, it might be a document. Um, we're here in Texas. We have a Texas birth certificate that's being sent to Germany. And so um, they um, already went to the Secretary of State and got a Texas Secretary of State apostille. Um, for Germany on their Texas birth certificate, and then they give everything to you, and you prefer, prepare a certified translation that they're going to submit to someone in Germany. Probably doesn't need to be notarized. Probably doesn't need a separate apostille on top of it, but ask questions and read the, read the letter that they got from whatever agency they're submitting it to and confirm what the requirements are. And then scenario three, the documents are going out of the U.S., you have to prepare a certified translation, maybe of a document that's already apostilled, and then get a second apostille 
on top of your translation. And so as these scenarios get more and more complicated, if you've never done it before and you're, you're unclear, you're like, I just got this weird translation order and I want to try it, but I want to make sure I get it right. I don't want to screw this up on my first attempt. You can always contact us. You can drop by with cookies like that guy from Kazakhstan, um, or you can just email us, whatever's more convenient, and, and we'll, we'll give you our suggestions, though. To be fair. <laughs> just suggestions. <laughs> we are not attorneys. We do not work for foreign governments. <laughs> when we offer advice, it is simply our opinion. We are not practicing law. Yeah. We are just speaking from our own experience, and it is still up to you to do what, what you feel is the best thing in a situation or to, to make the client make the decision. We, we sit here all the time and say, now, I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what other people have done. And then it's up to you, and I will translate whatever you ask me to translate. If I were you, I would do this. I don't even say that. I just say, I will translate whatever yeah. you ask me to, and then it's oh, up to you. And one other note to make, if you're not sure whether the end user will need a certified translation or a certified and notarized translation or a certified and notarized Napa Steel translation, and you want to err on the side of caution, it's always better to get more layers of official fanciness on your, on your translation. Nobody will reject it for having too many but they might reject it for not having enough. And so some people are like, I'm flying to Guatemala City tomorrow. I can't get a hold of my attorney there. I don't know what I need, but I want to, it's, it's really important to me. This is my one shot at getting my inheritance before the trial or whatever. Um, how can, what's, what's my best chance of making sure that anybody will accept it? And we're like, well, you could get it certified and notarized and apostilled, and then that'll cover all your bases and um, increase your chances that nobody will find something to reject it for. Yeah, nobody rejects it for having too many rubber stamps. <laughs> right. The more rubber stamps and sewing, the better. So something that's silly about Epistiles is it was designed to simplify the bureaucratic paperwork. Um, but instead, even though it's already in English on every Epistile in the world that I've ever seen, um, everybody in the U.S. wants it translated into just English. They don't want to see any foreign languages on there at all. And so when you C text like on this um, apostille from from China, um, from Hong Kong. Um, when you see text on there that's in English, the temptation is just to copy down that English into your translation. You're like, oh, I don't have to worry about this. I'll just I'll just transcribe it. But sometimes the English on there isn't actually what the Chinese says. Like they've um, rewritten it, or they've uh, summarized it, or omitted something, or added something so that it it looks more um, palatable to the English speaking reader. And we're being hired not to transcribe the English, we're being hired to translate the Chinese or whatever the language may be. So what we do is we just ignore the English entirely. We put a translator's note at the beginning and say something like, um, this is a bilingual document, but English text has been omitted um, for clarity and the following is a translation of the Chinese, something like that. And then we translate what the Chinese actually says. And then we have an image of the original on there so the bureaucrat who receives it can look back and forth and compare and confirm if he or she disagrees with um, the way we handled the bilingual text. And then there's always that little bit of French in there. If you're a French translator, translate the French into English or whatever language. If you're not, we know what it says. I mean, it's easy to figure that out even if you don't know French, but you're being hired to translate one language. And if French isn't your language, then don't come up with a translation of the French text. Just put a translator's note and says, say something like, um, sentence in French and then copy down in French exactly what it says. And then if no one's ever had a problem with that. No, because like we pointed out earlier, every apostille has that little thing in French. And so uh, so no matter where it's going, probably the bureaucrat that's receiving it has seen that and knows what it is. But again, you're only being hired to translate one language. And if you know Korean and you don't know French, then you shouldn't translate the French. The same thing with the, uh, the seals of countries and universities that have a motto in Latin underneath, we can all Google the Latin and figure out what it means, but we're not being hired as Latin translators. I don't think maybe one of you is, but probably not. Um, and so we just put a, in brackets, square brackets, we put something like a motto in Latin, and then we copy down the motto in Latin and leave it in Latin. So these are actual photos of um, the Apostille office here in Austin uh, with the friendly Apostille workers who we are on a first name basis with because we see them like three times a week. One of us or someone from our office is down there getting something Apostilled. 
and they're very nice and they're really faster than these characters from Zootopia, I think. Yeah. Um, and there may be in your state thousands of notaries, but there's only one secretary of state in certain states and commonwealths. It's called the Department of State, but it's the same idea. They might have more than one location, um, but here in Texas, I think Austin, there's this one, this one place in Austin on the corner of Brazos and, and, 11th. and 11th, right next to the Capitol, where you have to go and you have to pay for a curbside parking and you have to go and stand in line. And, and there's like these two ladies in the entire state who give all the apostilles. And if you live far from your secretary of state, you can do it by mail too. Um, there's each state will have its own form. And in a minute, you'll see the links to your state's forms. Um, the fee might be $15, $8, $10, $12. Each state sets the fee. They'll ask you what country it's going to, so they know whether to put the apostille or the authentication letter on there. But either way, they can send it to any country. They just need to know which one. And they want to be sure that it's not going to the U.S. because they cannot put an apostille on a document that's being used within the United States. And if you or your client are in a big hurry, there are um, private courier services that say for like $150, They'll do everything. You overnight it to them. Their courier goes downtown, does it by hand, and overnights it back to you. And um, once in a while, somebody who's about to leave the country needs to use a private courier. So this is just a link um, that you can open in your own PDF of the PowerPoints, and those should be clickable on your device. And you can find out more details about where your apostille office, how much it costs, and what their procedures are for submitting it in person or by mail. And if by chance it's not clickable for some reason, like it's really easy to Google Secretary of State Maryland and or Apostille Maryland or whatever state you're in and and find that information. Most of them have an FAQ page or something like that. And so for some reason that, that link isn't working. It's it's not hard to Google that. Um, okay, so how to charge clients. So depending on the level of authentication that your client or, or their attorney is requiring. And I did want to make a point. Um, immigration attorneys, sometimes it, it used to be that documents going to the US Immigration Service did require a notarization. And so some attorneys still want that on there. The Immigration Service does not require that anymore, but some attorneys will still ask for it. And so again, it's not up to me to practice law. It's not up to me to decide what the client needs. And so if the client says, my attorney says I have to have this, Okay, great. You shall have it. And so whatever they need. But um, anyway, how to charge them for things. One way is just to go around to some other translators in your area and find out what they're charging. What's what's the going rate for this kind of work in your area among your peer group? For your language pair. Yeah. Um, with your colleagues. And so you can do some mystery shopping and send, send a document out and, and find out what it does cost. Um, Make sure you know what it is that your client needs so that you're giving them everything they need. And so otherwise they're just going to come back and complain and then you're going to have to do it anyway. So you might as well get it right the first time. Find out what the end user needs. I have called doctor's offices before or universities and said, hey, what is it that you need me to do on this? Or, hey, I've got something from your office and I can't reveal information about the patient any more than you can, but can you tell me what these codes are? Anyway, um, but find out what they need so that you can give them what they need, um, especially if the what they're asking for. Maybe you go to their website and you just can't figure out what they're what they really need. You know, do some do some research, call them, whatever you need. They to might do. not have a policy. It might just be the personal preference of the person that processes these documents. So yeah. call that person and say, hey, what do you like to see on a translation? I want to make you happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, most translators charge by the word because it's the most accurate way to be sure that you're getting paid for the work you do and not overcharge the client but not undercharge yourself um so it's it's usually best to charge by the word but if there's a kind of document that you do a lot of and you already know about how much work you're putting into it then it's also fine to, to charge by the page um and so for like a, a birth certificate from spanish to english we would charge 60 bucks a page because I know what I'm getting into before I start the project. Except for Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Venezuela, but you are very wordy. <laughs> you like to tell us all the things. Um, but that that's going to be 
uh, you know, with your own experience, you will you'll be able to determine what what works best for you. Um, but consider how much of your time is being used and charge appropriately. And that includes if somebody is asking for a rush service. We have people come in all the time and say, but I need it today. What do you mean it's going to take two days or three days or however long you know, our wait list is already? <laughs> I can move you to the top of the list, but it's going to cost you more because I am having to push my work aside to take care of you first. And that's the way it is. This is capitalism. That's the way it works. In. So, um, so if, if people are asking you to do things that are inconvenient for you, it's okay to charge a little bit more about that for that. Um, when you're getting something notarized or apostilled for someone else, um, there may be a fee for the, the notarization itself, maybe $6. The apostille may be $15. Or free in, where did she or, say? Yeah. Um, Somewhere. Ohio? Yeah. Um, that's great. Right. But the time that it takes you to go and do that thing for them is is worth you, you should be remunerated for that work and so you need to charge what you consider to be fair to to do that work for them all right thank you Next slide. and there's some good questions in the chat we'll get to in a minute uh, you might want to become a notary public yourself look how happy this notary public is because he helped this charming couple buy their new house and was there for the signing of the documents and if you ever bought a house you know they're like 500 pages of documents that each require 75 signatures and notaries charge by the signature. And so if you, I, everybody here is in a different situation, different point in your career, but if you are not getting enough work currently and you want to add a sideline, consider become a notary public so that you can notarize other translator signatures and so that you can also work with realtors and um, home buyers and other people who need uh, notarization. Um, you, it'll help you stand out from other freelancers. I don't know any other translators that are notaries. Maybe they are and just don't put it on their signature line. Um, you can make a little bit of money off it. It's not a lot of money, um, but it, it's... You really can't make a living off of it, but it's, you know, a few extra bucks. Yeah. We have an attorney who co-offices with us and she's here like maybe once a week with signing a will for one of her clients and one of us will notarize her client's signature on the will, and we charge a fee for that. And so it, it covers our time, at least. Um, become the expert for your state. Uh, you'll have to fill out a form, pay a fee. Um, the application fee is under $50 here. You also have to go to a bank and take out a surety bond, which is an insurance product. You can also get errors and emission insurance if you want to cover yourself against liability. But the whole thing is probably under $100. And then um, you buy your own rubber stamp and your own logbook, and they put your license number or your notary. Is it the license or your notary? I, I think it's just your notary number. Whatever your number it is, they'll put it on there. And then um, just uh, read the instructions and follow the rules, and you'll stay out of trouble, and you can notarize away. So these are some uh, dangers to avoid. Beware, sharks ahead. Right. Um, when you're translating, be sure that you translate everything. Consider looking at a document in a language, in a, in, a, in a writing system that you are totally unfamiliar with. Maybe it's in Korean, Korean, or maybe it's in Sanskrit, or maybe it's something that you have no idea what it says. And, and I want you to imagine that because it's real easy to look at a document when you speak all the languages involved and go, well, it's obvious what this means. But if you're looking <laughs> at something that you, is super duper foreign to you, you think, well, but what is that right there? They didn't translate that one thing. What does that mean? And that's how every bureaucrat who doesn't speak a foreign language or your foreign language feels. And they want to know that that one stamp that just says verified doesn't say void. It's, it's <laughs> not like the clutter free zone. Like, no, I don't care. This that's right. why you want to, you want that's to translate great. every this last should be little then. thing. On the ground somewhere else. Um, figure out the more there you go. Let's go. Do you have the dabs? All right. I didn't bring them back home. Um, somebody's unmuted and I'm trying to mute you, but I can't see who. If you go there, if you go to the chat, you can mute everybody from it. Okay. All right, go ahead. Anyway, um, so be sure to translate every last little thing. Um, don't translate your own stuff uh, unless you're mute enough and you can get away with it. Um, probably it's more likely to get rejected. I'll just say that it's more likely to get rejected if you're doing your own stuff or for somebody that you know, like somebody with your own last name. Um, you cannot act as a notary on documents that you're signing yourself. 
um, and it's best to wait until you get to the notary to do the signing. Often, depending on what kind of statement you're signing, it probably needs to be signed right in front of the notary. Um, and a Secretary of State is only going to notarize documents from their own state. So a Texas Secretary of State isn't going to notarize something that has a Michigan uh, notary on it. They're only going to, you'll have to get that apostille in Michigan. So be aware of that. If you're, if you're dealing with people in different states or states other than the one you're in, you, um, things may need to be sent other places to get, get notarizations or apostilles on them. And this is uh, your panic button. If you are asked to do something and you panic and don't know how to do it, or you get halfway through and you're like, crap, I, I bit off more than I can chew, let us know. Uh, we're happy to help out. Or you can just say, hey, uh, I don't want to do this one. I'm too busy. I'm going to be in court all week. Uh, but I know some people who, are, who love working on this stuff. The more complicated, the better. And send them to text and translation. And we'll be happy to review the documents and help them out. Um, we, we here's our contact information. I want to try to answer a few of the questions that we've got in the chat window, um, and I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. Um, yes, uh, let's see, Suzelle, always look at the document before you quote it, because I've had so many people call on the phone and say, I've got this thing, it only has about 50 words on it, and what they mean is the 50 words that they think are important. And really, it's 300 words, but they are looking at what they think are the important words. So always look at a document before you quote it. Um, Let's see, New York survey. You can get a personalized stamp. Um, you do not want to put false information on a stamp. If you're um, if you're trying to certify the translation, you can put something about being court certified on there. Sure, uh, if you want to put like, I know uh, in Marco's certification statement, he just has a little thing about what is his license, his court interpreter license number is, and if you want to have a stamp that says certified court interpreter and your license number and put that stamp on there. I don't see why you couldn't. Now, I don't know anything about New York. I don't know what the rules are for, for stamps, but I, I wouldn't think that would be a problem. But, um, but in general, anybody in the world can order a rubber stamp for 10 or 20 bucks and they can put what they want on there as long as it's true. Right. As long as you're not making stuff up or, or imitating the stamp of another official business or you know, government office or something like yeah. that. Don't make it look too much like, some some government group. What else? Um, Luis says, how much do you charge to review a translation? Uh, we don't do that. Some people will review other people's translations. Um, so we as translators can do the apostille. You can't put on the apostille. You can go to the Secretary of State's office to get the apostille. Um, the, the Secretary of State doesn't seem to care who brings the document in. They're just authenticating the document itself. And so they're looking for the notary's signature and the notary's stamp and the original signature of the person, and they will kind of flip through and make sure it looks like an authentic document, um, and they put the, the apostille on there. Do note that the apostille gets attached by staple to the document that has the Texas seal on it. So if you tend to put your certification statement at the back and the notary, notary seal is on that at the back, then the apostille is going to get shoved in and stapled to the back page. So we put our certification statements on the top page and then just have pagination indicating it's one of three pages or one of six pages or whatever so that it can be stapled to the front because it's awkward when they have to staple it to the back page, but that's what they'll do. We're at the two hour point and so, one. yeah, and it's at two o'clock. <laughs> and so I've just put the, the link in the chat for the exit survey. Um, if you have to get off now, um, please click on that link and, and fill out just three short questions about your feedback on the survey. Um, we are not done here. We have, we're have we happy to stay on another 20 minutes and answer more questions. Um, but I wanted to um, ask you to submit the survey. It's helpful for us to improve these. And then also, if you're interested in coming next Saturday, here's a link to next Saturday's webinar, which is the 30 most misinterpreted words in English legalese. And those are 30 terms that, that are used by lawyers in ways that normal people don't use them. And so if you're a court interpreter or a legal translator, it's easy to choose the wrong uh, connotation of the word. And there's uh, some more information if you'd like to join us again next Saturday. Okay, so let's look at, um, and we can, let's see, form, which um, form is that? Nella asks, is it worth being ATA certified? Yes, Nella, it's great to be ATA certified. Uh, you get more work and you get uh, better paid work. 
but um, it won't change your life. Like since I got ATA certified, the difference that it's made is that I can bid on certain uh, government contracts, like the state judiciary will say, we want the project manager to be ATA certified in some language pair. And so then I'm qualified to bid on those contracts. Occasionally you have a client, like um, if somebody's going to a university and the university requires a foreign credentials evaluation of their degree from the old country, certain foreign credentials evaluation companies require an ATA certified translator to prepare the translation. So like maybe you know 1% of the jobs out there, it'll make a, a big difference and it'll qualify you for those. Plus it's just good as a, as a, to demonstrate your professional development and that you take your job seriously. I would certainly say be an ATA member. Um, there's a lot of resources available to you as an ATA member that are, are very useful. So I would recommend that. Um, but the difference between the work that Marco does as an ATA certified translator and the work that I do as a not ATA certified translator is not great. I mean, the, there's a difference, sure. It's, um, the, the, the thing that I like about it is I get to say, ooh, they want an ATA certified translator. <laughs> You're going to have to do this one. So it's to my benefit that he's <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Luis asks about a regular document translation, a civil notary signature. Um, I'm Luis, I'm unclear what you mean by a civil notary. I use civil notary to mean a notary in a civil law country like Mexico um, or in Louisiana. Louisiana has civil notaries. Um, if you mean a notary public signature, um, that's different from a civil notary signature. So if you could just get in there and, and specify, that would help. Um, Catherine says, just to clarify for translation, is the certificate of translation being apostilled or is the original document being apostilled? Yes. Yes. That's, That's the, the question. question. <laughs> That's what we always have to ask our clients. Which one needs to be apostilled? The original? Here's, here's your birth certificate from the state of Colorado. Do you need to take that to the Colorado Secretary of State? Or the translation, does that need to be certified notarized and then that apostilled? That's what you have to ask your client. And most of the time they're not sure. And so you kind of go back and forth and encourage them to call their embassy or their attorney, because that's not a question we know the answer to, because we don't know if when the document gets to Ecuador, what the people in Ecuador are going to want. We don't know. And unless the client can tell you, it's just a guess. And so you need to put that on the client though. They need to be the one that, that makes the final call and says, Put it, I want this epistilled or I want that epistilled. And then agree to it in writing. If you just do it verbally and then six months later their document gets sent back and their entire immigration process gets delayed, they're going to be angry. But if you have an email where you agreed exactly what was going to get epistilled and who is responsible for what, then it protects you against that kind of complaint. Or even on, on the invoice itself where you're listing out the line items of what what they're what you're charging them for make it clear just spell it out you know spanish to english translation this much and certification this much if you charge separately for that or notarization this much apostille on the such and such document this much so that they they are clear and you have backup and uh luis uh, um, can i say something marco please sorry sure go ahead arena uh sorry i'm not picture ready i wasn't uh, planning on being on the uh, <laughs> camera great. Uh, but just to clarify, the simple way of the um, the previous question about what is going to be uh, apostil apostilled, uh, according to the Hague Convention, uh, the apostille is only placed on an official document certifying the, um, but it is an original document, but also certifying the signature of the person that issued the original document. Right. So. Uh, it can be the apostille can either be put on the original birth certificate or on a notarized translation. Right. An apostille cannot be placed on a just certified translation because That's a translator correct. is not acting in a uh, official governmental capacity yes correct so yes. that's the easy way so the simplest so you as a translator can provide a certificate of translation and that's just your sworn statement mm -hmm. i swear that i did my best but if there's anywhere a word apostille uh, involved that means that you at least need to go to a notary and the notary 
certifies your signature, not the correctness of the translation, but the signature. And then the apostle certifies the signature of the notary, not the translation, not the signature of the translator, and not the translation itself. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's right. And Mirna, Mirna, Mima? Mima. Mima. Sorry. These are new glasses, too. I still can't read that. Um, yes, yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, that looks right. So um, she says, You've trans I've translated a document, got it notarized by the lady at the bank, and then sent it to the Department of State so they can apostille the translation to be used in another country. That's, that's perfect. I'm going to circle back around to Luis Ayala. Um, your question, Luis, about a notary public signing a regular document translation, I would say two-thirds of the translations we do, we do 200 translations a month, let's say, um, and about two-thirds of them don't need any certification or notarization or apostille. Maybe a third of them need uh, notarization, and maybe like 1% uh, of them need an apostille. So it all depends on what kind of document it is and who it's being sent to, um, whether it needs a notary public signature or not. Okay, scroll back up and see if we missed any questions. All right. Okay. Invoice after the work is completed, you get down payments for larger requests. That's a great question. And we've kind of gone back and forth about that. And in fact, I saw something on uh, the ATA website about how to be sure for freelancers. It's a, it's a um, uh, I think it's going to be in September, a webinar on how to be sure you're getting paid. And our, um, I love getting paid. I like it a lot. It's a favorite thing of mine. <laughs> and so what we do is for small clients that, that are just coming in, like and getting a birth certificate or something like that, they pay up front, we make sure they've got a receipt and then they come and pick it up, you know, however many days later or mail it out, mail it out. Yeah, that's fine. Um, if we've got somebody big that comes to us, you know, and they say, we've got this order and it's $5,000. Cool. I like $5,000, but I really want to make sure that I actually get the $5,000 and I don't just do a whole bunch of work and then get buckets. And so if it's somebody that you know you can get a hold of, like the University of the state that you live in, you know, University of Illinois, they're going to be pretty reliable to pay and so you can put them on a net 30 invoice or something and, and do the work if you feel com confident that 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 organization is going to pay you then it's fine to go ahead and start if it's somebody you've never worked for before and you mean the website looks kind of eh, and you're just you, you don't feel comfortable i ask for either 50 percent down and then the other 50 percent on completion or i have also said we will start on the work with a net on net 30 terms with a credit card on file. And if by the 30 day point, I have not received payment, the credit card will be charged for the full amount. And that's usually enough to get people to do. I mean, not that we've never had somebody run out on us, but, um, Very but yeah, it hasn't happened in, in a while. Um, because we got wise, <laughs> because we quit just letting people say, oh yeah, do this thousand dollar job. And we're like, cool, yeah, thousand dollar job. Okay, I'll get started. And then we get ghosted. So getting something, you want enough money over the barrel that it's gonna <laughs> hurt them a little if they if they if they have to walk away without Skip town. Yeah. The first year we were doing this, we would let people place orders by email and then they would say, Oh, I'll, all I have is cash. I don't have any way to pay you with a card. Um, this was years ago, back before there were all these like PayPal and easier ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, I'll just pay cash when I pick it up. And we kept on having people just disappear. We never knew what yeah, happened to them. They changed their minds. We had a file of old translations and never got picked up. And we realized this is a big waste of time. Yeah. And I say, make sure you've got enough money over the barrel. Because I did have one woman walk in one time. And all she had was $11 cash. And she was like, well, can I give this to you? to start on it and then I'll pay it the rest. And it was like maybe a $50 translation or something. I was like, yeah, okay. And I'm telling you that $11 sat on my desk for like six years or something <laughs> just because I was like, oh, what do I do with this $11? Like I hate to just- She never came back. Know, she never, and finally I just stuck the money in my pocket and moved on with my life. But <laughs> you need to have enough. Like if she paid 25 or she paid all the whole 50 or whatever it was, then it would have been enough to make her want to come back and get her translation. If it was only 11 bucks, she could walk away. Yeah, most people are trustworthy. Zell, yes. We like yes. Zell. Yes, I love Zell. 
You're welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today. You've been great. Lots of good questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you're welcome to, if you think of a question or if you want to stay on a couple more minutes, we, we've got a couple more minutes, but if not, um, look for the email on Monday with a link to the recording and you can go back and watch anything you missed. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you. so much. I Thank you so much. Form. Have a good weekend. If you could please send me the form and the link. Yes, I will. Thank, thank you. Yes. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Hope to tune in to more of these. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. До встречи. Thank you. Have a great weekend.